So I'm going live right now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing our crowdfunding campaign on the Indiegogo platform. Please donate and share at HTTPS, cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Anthony Hayes. Anthony, are you ready to be great today? Absolutely. Anthony Hayes has spent more than 18 years in, in communications, crisis and issue management, and political and legis legislative campaigns. A seasoned C-level advisor, Anthony has cultivated an energetic, fast-growing company, now trusted to execute strategy for prominent clients around the globe. He served leaders at the highest levels, including presidential candidates, members of the U.S. cabinet, governors, and other elected officials, C-suite executives, law enforcement officials, and high-ranking health and legal professionals. Anthony, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy person doing a lot of great things. No, thank you. We're happy. To, I'm happy to be here with you. And you're, you're coming and you are in New York City, correct? Yeah, we're based in New York City. Exactly. Can you spend some time to talk about how, what it's like in New York City right now? Because I'm not like, I'm no city I walk through here. I think Seattle and New York City, like two of the epic centers for COVID and all that kind of stuff. Is it getting better? Like, is all the stuff you're in the news actually true or is it a different story? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's listen, I think it's, uh, you know, as a, I, you know, I've lived in New York uh, since 1998. And so I always get asked, you know, <laughs> what's it, what's really like in New York City. So depending on what's going on around the world or the being uh, put in the media, everybody's always asking me what it's like in New York. Um, listen, it was certainly an epicenter for COVID-19. Um, it was a very uh, surreal. You know, I was in New York on 9-11 as well. Um, and I would sort of put in the early days of the pandemic once we shut down um, and the things that the things you were seeing in, in in New York really had a it just had a very eerie feel about it um, in a way that sort of felt very similar. Um, but today, you know, given the fact that uh, there are so many vaccines uh, happening um, and I think that there is a real sense of hope. I think everybody in New York, New York City in particular, is very eager uh, to, to find some level of uh, safety and going back out. I think you're starting to see people, you know, you're seeing businesses really talk about opening up um, again and bringing their employees back. A, a lot of the conversations we're having with our clients are around that and sort of the best ways they can do that. Um, and, you know, for us in the early days, one of the things we offered was pro bono help to especially restaurants uh, in New York because they uh, have truly been decimated uh, across the New York City uh, uh, landscape. And it is really, really uh, unfortunate because a great many of them just didn't survive. So, but you are seeing it happen, but it still has a very different feel in New York City. But, you know, I do think overall with the vaccines, you're starting to see hope uh, in a lot from a lot of people. Yeah, restaurants for that, I doubt, took an unfair burden of, of of the COVID crisis, I believe. 100%. So Anthony, 100%. On a very basic level, what's the difference between public relations communications? Well, <laughs> um, I think communications, you know, can take on two things. It can be internal or it can be external. Um, both are very important. I think they both sort of uh, uh, intertwine with one another. Um, and I, I would say public relations really, I think where it, the, the real definition for that is everybody in what they want out into the universe, right? So I think public relations has taken on a lot of different uh, formats now that we obviously have social media formats like this podcast that we're on today. Um, but I think anything that you want to be public facing, I would really sort of put in the in the public relations category because anything that you are putting out in the universe, the public, uh, can certainly turn into um, either be misunderstood um, or, or it could just be a very serious misstep, which could lead to a crisis, which is a lot of the work that we do. I would say about 50% or so of our work is crisis management, crisis communications. Anthony, so do you have to have a, a different set of ways or different method based on the company, like if nonprofit versus for-profit versus you know, million dollar company versus a smaller company versus government, is it, is the, is the method the same or is it like kind of tweaked each time? Yeah. The, the tools and tactics are basically the same, right? So, you know, you're going to define your audience and then you're going to figure out how you're going to speak to speak to your audience. Is it going to be a social media campaign? That's going to be most effective. 
or is it going to be an earned media campaign where you're going out and pitching stories to reporters and getting them interested in what you're talking about? Um, I would say the difference in scale and size of companies is is what you find often, and you know I think this is true. Uh, you know, the smaller the company, the more nimble they are. Uh, maybe they would be a little bit more edgy than you know, let's say a big giant like Bank of America or something, right? They're just, their messaging and their response and how quick they are and, you know, slapstick kind of uh, humor or, you know, they'll just have a different approach to it. I think the smaller they are and more nimble they are and probably a bit more willing uh, to take risks because, you know, they just, they're on a, they're on a much smaller playing field. So that's, I think that's really the only difference, but the, the tools and the tactics are really the same, regardless of size, regardless of company, government, for-profit, non-profit. Anthony, when should a startup start thinking about PR? Like if a startup's out there, they're about to you know, raise a seed round or a round or about to launch a product. Is that too early or is PR really for like bigger companies? <clears throat> well, I would say, uh, I, I would probably phrase that a little differently. I think, uh, you know, First is everybody always oversimplifies communication, right? They always sort of think, oh, well, we can wait or like, you know, they, they really, everyone thinks they can do communication, but I think what they find out is, is that it's actually very difficult. And so I always think, um, you know, and I've always benefited both when I have been in-house and hired uh, companies like the one that I run or now as the vendor on the outside, you know, by getting somebody outside, whether you're a small company or a big company who can come in and even just sort of test the ideas and test the messaging, even if you're just going out to talk to investors to raise that round of money, you know, hearing from somebody to say, gosh, that just doesn't, that's not resonating. Why are you sort of saying it that way? And really just sort of help with messaging. And then you can get into the place of, you know, I don't think that you know, there's always, you want to be strategic about when you're getting press because you don't want to sort of get too far ahead of yourself. And especially I would imagine when you're especially raising money, you want to be really careful about that. Um, just in terms of how you're talking about it, the kind of money you're raising, how you're going about it. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think it's ever too early to have conversations. It may not be time to, to pull the trigger for forward facing things with reporters and media, but I, I don't think it's ever too early to, to figure out um, how you're communicating and what you're saying. So Anthony, from your, from your um, point of view, what, a, what do business leaders generally get wrong about public relations and communications that you consistently see they, they getting wrong about it? So much, <laughs> so much. <laughs> so much. Um, and I, I don't think they mean to, right? Like nobody want nobody, when you see, situations where someone is having a misstep or they've gotten something wrong no one was sitting in a room and thought gosh let's really screw this up right like no one no one meant to do that so i i i, I have a lot of empathy for communicators that at work in house and and because i've i've done both um i think the biggest thing is um i think again oversimplifying communication and really not taking the time to think things through, make sure you do have, you do sort of test out your messaging with a diverse group of people to make sure that it's, it's understood. You know, I, I managed media and communication for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which is a large agency in New York that manages all the bridges, tunnels, airports, uh, owns the World Trade Center and was a part of rebuilding the World Trade Center after 9-11, works for two governors. And we would often get called in, the communications team, we would get called in minutes before there was this really big complicated announcement about policy or, you know, there was a problem at a bridge with an engineering thing and the engineering thing was actually super complex, but we would have to break it down pretty quickly so that the general public could understand it. But I think the biggest thing is just people wait too long to bring in their communications teams, uh, you know, the C-suite. Uh, has an incredible idea, and it is an incredible idea, but I think they've oversimplified how they're going to message it and how they're going to communicate it. Can you go more detail why it's important to run any communication past a diverse set of eyes and ears? Yeah, well, listen, it, I think that what you're going to get is, you know, I, I, as, you know, I write a lot for a living, and I also edit a lot and read a lot, and I, I would say that the more that I have other people read my stuff, the more, the more that we're sort of testing messaging across different groups, it helps you be 
um, and, and develop a message that is going to resonate with more of your audience, right? The, the, we live in a diverse world and I think making sure that you are going across different audiences um, and that it is a diverse group, that you have tested it with women, that you have tested it with, you know, whether it's black employees or black people or people of color or LGBTQ, like you want to try to have as many voices, especially given the sensitivities of the communication space that we live in today. I think everybody is trying very hard to, well, I'd like to say everybody is, I'm not sure if that's entirely true, but I think there is an effort um, that people are making. And sometimes I think there could be some awkwardness in what might be an ally moment uh, to support something. Um, and, and I just, I think that sometimes they go too quick with the message and maybe hadn't checked in with people. So I just think it's, you, you always benefit the more people that you have that, you know, don't look and sound like you. Uh, it's always true. Always been true. So Anthony, before I started doing podcasts and have my own company, I would always like, hear people speak on TV and they would say like something like pretty stupid, right? And they always say, oh, I misspoke. I was thinking to myself, you didn't misspeak. You meant to say this. But now I realize there is such a thing as misspeaking. If someone misspeaks and says something <laughs> like they totally, like totally out of the ordinary, like really messes up, how, what do they need to overcome to just, to just go and do another press conference, own up to it? Or what should they do? Yeah, it depends on the scale, right? Like, you know, I think similar to just to use the example that you just use, I think if, you know, if you are on TV or even in this example, you know, I may misspeak or you may misspeak. And I think we can, as we say, clean it up, you know, clean it up right now. And I could just sort of say very openly, like, oh my goodness, let me, let me start that over. I'm misspeaking. And, and I know I'm, I know I'm not saying this right. And I apologize. Right. So you could just immediately own it in the room. So, and even if you're on camera or doing a press conference, you know, it's very common to just like stop and simply say, I, I apologize. I misspoke. Let me take that again. And everyone really, I would, I, you can't say everyone, but a great majority of people understand getting tongue tied. There's a difference in getting tongue tied and then just saying something that is completely egregious that, you know, you shouldn't have probably said in the first place uh, in a public setting. And then to the bigger scale of it, yeah, you may have to do um, either a press conference or an interview and do, you know, what we call the mea culpa moment of, you know, I was completely wrong. I made a mistake. I should never have said that, you know, those kinds of, we've all seen those kinds of things. So. So Anthony, um, I, I believe you, your company recently won an award in something called PR week. Can you talk about that? Yeah, no, we're super, I appreciate you asking. Cause we're, um, you know, as a small firm, we're super jazzed about that. We, uh, did work with times up now, which was doing work, uh, in New York state specifically around, uh, increasing the statute of limitation for a sexual assault victim to bring uh, bring a an allegation, I guess, a crime and report a crime, and so therefore it increases the amount of time because you know any any sexual assault survivor who goes through that, it may be hard to sort of to either a understand that it happened because the trauma, you know, there's any number of reasons that it may take time to bring the charges forward. So they, they times up now hired us to sort of go up into Albany with them and really go through a legislative campaign and really help them with that. And uh, we were so proud to support them and PR week uh, just had their uh, PR awards uh, that went across a long, a whole range of um, categories. And we were uh, selected as uh, an honorable mention for best in public affairs for 2021 for that work with Times Up Now. And both because of the work and just because we're a small firm, we were super excited about it. That's, that's very good news for you. Congrats on that, Anthony. I Thank know, you. I know you're Max. proud of your people. I know a lot, a yeah. lot of hard, I know a lot of hard work when it is that. A lot and, a, and a, a lot of incredible people and, and a great partner. Like we were really proud to work with them. So uh, it seems like you're coming, you do a lot of what I call crisis media relations uh, is that, yes. is that just something your firm specializes in or you just something you just like to do or how did that come about? Uh, I think just because of my background, I have always been <laughs> in crisis. Um, <laughs> so I think that um, just my work has always been really fast paced and crisis driven, um, whether you're talking, you know, presidential campaigns, which is just sort of a constant day of just a, a, a 
blinding amount of, of, of crisis management, um, as well as my time at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And I've worked on legislative campaigns. Just everything has always been very timely and rushed um, and can change on a, on a dime, so to speak. And uh, we, we do quite a bit of that work. So it's just, I've really cut my teeth as a communicator in crisis. How does one become a PR person? Is it you need a certain type of degree, certain type of background? You just look into There's, it. Like, how, how does that come about? Yeah, I have a political science degree from the New School in New York, um, and and there definitely are degrees. I <laughs> I did not have one. I don't think I originally sort of knew I would grow up to be, um, you know, a PR communication person. Um, but I do. I I have realized it is sort of a, a skill set. I think you have to have. Um, a storytelling skill set. I think you have to be able to um, come into that. No, I, I, I think what it takes is just sort of wanting to be in the business. It, it is not a, it's not an easy business because it's a very fast paced, a lot of work, stay on top of a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of grinding out work that happens in, you know, PR. I think a lot of people see the glamorous side where, you know, you're, you're rolling up to a press conference with possibly a celebrity or, you know, a, a very recognizable figure and, you know, planes, trains, and automobiles. And it seems very exciting and very fun, but that's, you know, the press conference is 15 minutes. <laughs> it was 48 hours of complete and utter chaos and just grinding out work and, you know, pitching reporters to get to make sure that they're coming to the press conference, making sure that there's a riser so that there's, you know, room for the cameras. And, you know, there's just a lot of logistical work that goes behind especially large scale press events that just people don't, you know, you only see the shiny part and it's, so it seems very exciting and it is, it's wonderful. And, and that really, it's certainly, um, I always call it a drug. It's very addictive sort of being in those, um, in the bubble, you know, where you have those really beautiful, um, high profile moments that, you know, every communicator wants to be a part of where everyone's talking about what you're doing. And that's, that's thrilling, but it's also, it is really a small part of it. So I think people really have to understand you've got to be willing to put in unimaginable long hours and a lot of work because it is not as, as it's not all glamour. It's not, it's not all flash bulbs and glamour. And I have to imagine when you do like when the public might see something that's a successful PR event, you're like, this went wrong. This was a timed up right. You see all these things oh. in the background that drives you, you know, batshit crazy. Oh, I'm, but yeah, no, I'm, think, oh, this is a great press conference. And but you're like, oh my goodness, it was horrible. No, exactly. I'm completely ruined. I was on, it's very funny that you bring that up. I was on a plane recently and, um, oh my gosh, I feel terrible because I'm going to like probably call out some of my <laughs> friends, but, um, you know, uh, at the time, President-elect Biden flew into Andrews Air Force Base. This is on the day before inauguration. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into these really big, what, what, called presidential stagecraft, right? Like you think about it, where's the plane going to be chalked? Where are the reporters going to be? What's going to go on, et cetera. And this plane pulled in. And for some reason, there was another plane tail sticking up out of the what? shot. And I just... <laughs> And I, I was on a plane <laughs> traveling somewhere and I saw it in this little screen on the back of someone's seat. And I like pulled out my camera and I scroll, you know, and I scrolled in and took a photo of it and I sent it to someone. I was like, see, this is what I mean. This is what I'm talking about when I say like it's there's a lot of like things you think about. And, you know, I'm sure. And this is the other challenge with these really big press moments is there's only so much you can control, which is, you know, true with life. But I'm sure they probably sweated the small stuff and thought about that plane arrival for days. And then somehow a plane was there <laughs> and they was probably nothing they could have done about it. Right. So I'm sure they sweat the details on that, but it, you do when you do this kind of work and um, especially a, a shout out to all of the people who do that, that kind of work in particular, it's, it's so hard and, and, and it really is an enormous amount of work that goes behind it for these moments that you see and everyone else is like, oh, that's wonderful, but we're ruined. I can never watch things normally anymore. So. Anthony, how much is your time spent up, you know, quote unquote, managing other like media people and journalists and newspaper people? Oh, that's interesting. It's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that I have a great team of people who are also good at that. So, um, you know, as the business has grown and we've gratefully um, added on um, less of that, but, but I, I would say, I don't know, 
solidly 25, 30% of my day. And some of it is just, I, I, you know, these are, I've been doing this for years. So these are my friends. So sometimes it's, you know, it's in business of information. So sometimes we're just gossiping over text, but um, yeah, I would say a good 20, 30% of my day. My guess is, uh, you know, my team is probably more than me, but um, there's a lot of reaching out, talking, understanding, especially if you're shaping and working with somebody to help uh, put a story, if you're working with a reporter on a story and, you know, making sure they have all the facts they have, you know, if they need to talk to someone on background, there's a lot of logistics that goes into just sort of shaping what you might read in uh, the Wall Street Journal or New York Post or, or you know, New York Times. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't just happen. You know, there's a lot of coordinating that goes on. So I have to imagine there's a lot of like intertwining, uh, you know, uh, intermingling of business, friends, life. How do you make sure you keep that separated like you need to, or is it just like one, one big, you know, mixture of, you know, business or life and friendship? And it, I don't know. Separated? I don't know. <laughs> I, my guess is it's just a big mess. Um, but no, I do. I mean, I, I am very, I, mean, I am a very structured person just in terms of, you know, times that I wake up, things that I do. So I do feel very good about making sure that I have personal time and things like that. But, um, you know, I like what I do for a living. It's a lot of fun. And I, I would say I even, even the times where, you know, a, a reporter and I might be in the middle of a contentious back and forth, you know, I think there is a lot of respect, um, uh, at least on my side, they, they may not respect me. Um, but there's a lot of respect on my side for them and what they have to do because the business of media is just a very different world. And so I, I, I have a, a very good time doing what I do. So it doesn't feel too much like work. Um, even though, you know, I, I have been known to, you know, get up and leave dinners just because I had to start working again. So. And you've been doing this for around 18, 20 years. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. What, what, are, what are some ways both, I would say both pro good and bad that the, the, the landscape has changed in PR and communications and media. Ooh. Um, you know, good, I would just sort of say the simplicity of, you know, texting, I just, the, 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 you know, it cuts a double-edged sword, it cuts both ways, right, the fact that we're always available, and the fact that we're always available is both good and terrible. Um, uh, I would say the things that are bad um, is that um, how we report on, and I understand why reporters do it because it's just be, become what it is. Um, but I do think reporting, you know, when, when reporters tweet out sort of an idea that they have or tweet out something that they're hearing about a story or it, it, it carry, you know, when it's a reporter for a major outlet, it carries a lot of weight. And so, you know, the, the social media of it is both a blessing and a curse as well. And so I, I just, I, I do worry about that. And just given that I think part of what 2021 and probably the next decade is going to be about is sifting through all the misinformation and trust. I think there's a real misinformation problem. And then I think there's a real trust problem. Um, and so I'm not sure that all the social media tweeting um, that's going on uh, across the board is probably helping. Um, I'm sure there's a way to do that. Uh, I certainly am not smart enough to figure that out, but I do notice that quite a bit that reporters will um, tweet out something about something or someone and it because they belong to a national outlet, it, it can carry the same weight and get reported on as if it was a story. And it was just sort of like, a, hey, don't you think it's funny that so-and-so blah, blah, blah? And then it's on CNN. And there was never a story. And no one ever fact-checked it or no one ever, and that's just the pace, it's the pace. It's a very, it's a very complicated pace to live with. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. You, but. you, 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 you did. <laughs> hey, Anthony, what are ways you see public relations being used incorrectly? Uh, to take advantage, right? So we saw a lot of this, m much to my chagrin, with all of the beautiful things that you saw in terms of community response, doctors' responses, nurses' responses during COVID. You also saw uh, people trying to take advantage of 
the crisis. Um, so I think when you see that happen, um, where it's not a genuine, they're not really putting something genuine into the, the space. They're putting something out there that, you know, they're, they're selling something trying to take advantage of a moment. So I think using a crisis, especially for to, to hawk a brand or to, to do things like that, that's really the, probably the worst example. And you see it all the time. So it's not a, it's not a COVID-19 specific thing. It's just people can smell when someone is taking advantage of something. Anthony, what's your opinion on this? So business leaders speak out on politics and social issues, or they, they, they read just strictly neutral, or do they, do they have a responsibility being, you know, business leaders that speak out on different items that's going on in the world right now? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's changed, and I think both good and bad, is that business leaders are speaking out. Um, I And I also think what's what's more important to sort of like realize is that it's not just the consumers of the brand that are expecting business leaders to step speak out because consumers want to be associated with the brand that makes them proud. Um, but it's employees too. Employees are expecting, you know, their employers to speak up um, and raise their voice, uh, especially as it comes to um, inequality or social justice. Um, you know, I think a, a, a wonderful example, and I use this quite a bit, you know, my guess is Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, which is one of the largest banks in the world. Um, and anytime Jamie Dimon speaks, it really does become a bit of a market defining event. Um, and he, uh, a few days before the 2020 election, I think because everybody was so concerned about the results of the election, sent an internal email to his staff saying, listen, regardless of the results of the election, we all need to come together, we need to move forward, um, and we need to create the kind of, you know, change we want in the world kind of message. But it was a really positive, hopeful, forward thinking message that, you know, I, and I don't know if their comms team did or not, but in my opinion, if I was working on that comms team, I sure would have made sure that a reporter got a hold of that internal email because, you know, it also set a tone for the market that no matter what happens with the election, we all need to come together and move forward. And so, no, I don't, my, I don't know Jamie Dimon, just to be clear to all the listeners or have a, any contract with them, but my guess is they would never want to be speaking out before a presidential election. I, I would imagine he wouldn't want to be. I imagine he would like to just be doing his job and servicing the, all the customers that they have, you know, around the world. But in the world we live in, I think there is absolutely um, an expectation. And I think um, doing it in an authentic way is the most important thing uh, and, and sticking to what you, you know, staying, finding the right way to speak out about it so that you're staying in your lane and not sort of turning into something that you're not. You're, you may not be an expert on, you know, equality for women or LGBTQ or social justice. So, so you can speak out about your values, because I do believe, obviously, that every crisis is an opportunity to share about who you are. Um, and that's what I think leaders should do. They should, they should view all, all these bumps in the roads or opportunities or crisis, I think, or th they should view it as an opportunity to speak out. So I'll make this number up, maybe, maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, like, you really didn't know who a CEO of a company was. Of course, you knew who Steve Jobs was, you know, Bill Gates, but most CEOs, you didn't know who they were, right? Nowadays, I'm like, of course, everyone's not like Gary Vaynerchuk. He's probably an extreme example, but more CEOs are being like, I want to say forced, but, you know, made to be more like Gary Vaynerchuk, more be public facing, public speaking. The CEO role and the company roles are pretty much one the same now. Is this a good change, bad change? Like, how does this come about? And what do you think about that? I'm not sure if it's good or bad. I just think it sort of is. And I think it's it goes to the point of, you know, because of that, I do think, you know, C-suites have to really wrestle with how they want to do that. You know, some some CEOs are very good at it. Um, some aren't, um, you know, and I think it's important that uh, they that they spend the time on, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice we're always giving people, especially before they're going to give a speech or a media interview or is write something is you want to prepare 
And I think a lot of times people think they can sort of, you know, we've seen this um, in a couple of instances where people think they can just jump up on the panel and not really sort of go through, you know, who else is on the panel with you? You know, what are the topics? You know, what are the questions you, that they think are going to be asked? You know, and, and also sort of do a little mock, you know, back and forth with your team because, you know, similar to what we were talking about earlier and what leads people into sort of misspeaking is, you know, you can have an idea of how you want to answer a really complicated question on a panel, but then all of a sudden when you're speaking it out loud, it's very different than thinking about it in your head. And so, you know, one of our biggest pieces of advice to people is to read things or speak things out loud because it doesn't, it changes when you say it out loud, the cadence of how you say it, you might get tripped up on a word, you know, it just, it's different. And I believe people should make sure CEOs should understand that because of the fact that they are more public now than ever and more known than ever, they have to be better at that, but they have to practice. Yeah. So suppose the CEOs out there, you know, they know they got to be a public facing person. They're like kind of introverted, not really comfortable being the public speaking. Is this something they just got to get over and like train themselves to do it? Like, like you said, in practice, practice, practice. Because I'm, I'm guessing this probably shouldn't be something you head off to a VP, right? This is something you, a CEO you need to do yourself, right? Well, it just depends on what it is. But the bigger stuff, you should you should want your C-suite out there and you should want them out there speaking. You can always pass stuff off. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, some CEOs do and they just, and they're fine with that. But I think, um, certain things require the, 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 the main person in charge, you know, whether, whether, no matter who is in charge, you need to have that person speaking. And so I, I just think that it is, it is something that regardless of your personality type, you can get better at, um, you know, it does require people, you know, listen, it's that I think a lot of people have nightmares about, you know, showing up to give a speech, you know, naked or whatever the funny like <laughs> scenarios are. Right. But the, the way you do have to be brave in, in terms of showing up and, and trying. And, and, you know, I think it's also one of the reasons that I think sometimes it is very, one of the things that we get brought in quite a bit to do is actually media and speaking training for people because, what happens when you have an internal team, right? The CEO is used to hearing that internal team over and over again. And so sometimes it's better to just have somebody that the CEO doesn't know, because that may be what the interview is like with the reporter. This, you know, the CEO may have never met that reporter. Um, so having, having external people sort of run, run and external people will be probably more willing to challenge the boss when the boss is not doing well um, versus the staff who has to sort of be there every day. You know, if you have somebody come in specifically to handle, uh, media training and speaking, uh, training, you know, <laughs> they're there for that project and leave. And if, the, if the boss gets pissed at them for giving them feedback, um, you know, <laughs> it's not on them. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Like for myself, you know, I was an officer in the army, did a lot of public speaking there. Of course I do the podcast. Oh, you know, I do a lot of public speaking for my company. And always never fails. Like 10 minutes before anything I have to speak, I get this like fear. And I think of ways to get up, right? If I don't show up, would anyone notice? If I just have someone else do it for me, would anyone notice, right? And of course, then I always like work through it. Okay, let's, let me do it and it's fine, right? But every time, like 10 minutes before, I just like all these negative thoughts come my mind, like, you don't want to do this. You're not qualified, you know? Yeah, well, no, I think people should, I think people should always view the nerves before doing something as a good thing because it means they care. And I think it means that they want to do well. And so I think, you know, there's 8 million ways to sort of harness that energy um, and, and really sort of, you know, I've seen some people go out and, uh, you know, in a, in a spectator way, I've seen them go out and, and to give a speech and they come out and they just sort of say, hey, I'm so uncomfortable. Um, I'm really nervous. I hope you all will bear with me. And it's a really disarming thing for the audience. The audience immediately is like, oh my gosh, I feel your pain. And then, you know, the, the, everybody's listening. And so there's lots of ways that, you know, you can sort of deal with that, but it's totally normal to have that. It would be um, abnormal not to want to do well. And I think, you know, unless you're some of the top, top tier people who are always, always, always in front of a camera or always, always, always in front of an audience, you know, I think it, it, 
gets less and less the more you do it, but you, you, you're always going to have a little bit. So earlier you talked about uh, every crisis opportunity. Can you uh, go into that in more detail? What do you mean oh, yeah. I'm a big believer in the fact that when something happens, if there's a crisis, um, whether it's a, it's a self-inflicted crisis or, you know, a crisis that you're having to sort of speak out on that you may not have wanted to, but, you know, it's the right thing to do because of wherever your business is positioned. Um, it gives everyone an opportunity to speak to their values um, and to speak about who they are and to speak about what problem they're trying to solve in the world. Um, and they may have made a mistake. They need to own that if that's the kind of, you know, sort of crisis that we're talking about. But um, I think a lot of times, you know, it, people naturally get defensive. Um, and I think that what it, what it always provides is an opportunity to sort of explain, you know, your position, where you're coming from, who you are, you know, what you believe in, what your mission is, what your vision is. Um, but it's an opportunity to define who you are um, one more time, right? Um, and I think any time that a, a, an organization or a, a leader gets an opportunity to define who they are, to define what they believe in, even if it's through the lens of a crisis, um, I view that as an opportunity because it it gets it gets a, it gives them a chance to introduce themselves to possibly an entire new group of people who didn't know them, or maybe they didn't understand what that company was about or that leader was about. And so, um, I very much view it as as an opportunity, and it also um, can help take the 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 rush and the uh, anxiety and the fear and all those things that happen when a crisis is happening out of it because it feels more empowering when you're talking about what you believe in. Anthony, is there a, any type of crisis that your company will not take on? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, we definitely have turned things down. Um, I don't I don't know that I would have a specific thing because we really have. Um, we get called for lots of things that, lots of things. And I would say it would really be, we take it on a case by case basis versus sort of like just a universal, oh, we never do that. Um, we don't really sort of do that. Um, it's really case by case. Okay. So next question, and you don't have, you don't have the answer, you can't answer this, it's fine. Is there a CEO out there that you can point to and say, this CEO is doing public relations the right way? Or, he, or he, this person gets it? Oh yeah. I mean, I already sort of, I gave my sort of big example right now. It's I, I do, I have a lot of regard for Jamie Dimon and the way he's doing things. I think, uh, I think, you know, obviously there's, there's certainly moments he could have done certain things better and said things better like every leader, but like by and large, um, I think his messaging is forward looking and hopeful. Um, and I think that given uh, just the challenges that we have all experienced through the last year with COVID. And, you know, uh, we obviously live in fractured political times, which is just difficult. Um, and, and I think people are wanting leaders to, even if they don't know the answer, to, to be hopeful and to be forward thinking and to provide vision and to provide um, a direction. And I, I think he's done a, uh, done a very, very good job of that. Anthony, why is building inclusivity in organizations so important to you? Oh, well, as a member of the LGBTQ community, you know, I have uh, certainly experienced the years of, uh, of my life where I have been butted up against inequality in, in our country. Um, from, you know, and I worked for the human rights campaign for a number of years and worked on marriage equality um, in multiple states. Um, in Washington, D.C., I worked on uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell and uh, other big pieces of legislation, uh, the Matthew Shepard Act, which uh, is the hate crimes increased uh, the hate crimes law to include LGBTQ people in it. Um, so, I just have sort of been on the side of that. You know, I think it is um, very limiting. I think it's very short-sighted. Um, and I think that um, what, you know, everybody's out here wanting to 
um, have opportunity and they want to do the best they can. And I think everybody actually wants to work really hard, but, um, you know, when there are certain members of the community who don't have access, um, to the same sort of laws and responsibilities that, you know, others have, you know, at least in my experience, sort of as an LGBTQ person, um, you know, I don't, I, I couldn't, do a number of things that my straight counterparts could do. And that's simply just because they were straight. So I think um, I, I'm a sort of big believer that there's enough room for everybody <laughs> and we should um, be as inclusive as we can be. Um, we may not always agree. Um, you know, it may not always make us comfortable, but I think we should um, work to be as inclusive as, as possible. So th this is kind of the same subject, you know, I think a lot of companies like, like say stuff, like they say they're inclusive, but maybe they're not right. I mean, maybe it would be a bad example, but like when George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota, every single company in the United States did like, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, post, right? But, yeah. you know, were they really inclusive? Were they hiring black people? Were they like supporting all the cause? Or was this like a, a opportunity to, you know, do some branding for themselves, right? And then is it, I think some people say, well, it's a good thing they're getting started. Other people say, no, it's bad because they're like, they're, they're a farce. What's what's your yeah. take on that? Well, look, I think um, <clears throat> I think one of the blessings um, that we've seen from all of the people sort of in the streets and demanding equality is um, the fact that we know when someone is just sort of doing lip service, right? Um, and I can say, you know, I can speak to my personal experience as a member of the LGBTQ community. You know, I feel similarly, you know, every month in, uh, in, in, in excuse me, at, in, in June every year is pride, you know, across the country. And every major brand on the planet puts a rainbow flag on everything. And, you know, it's a little bit like, okay, well, yeah, <laughs> but are you helping, you know, your employees who may need help with surrogacy or, you know, time off for kids, do you do that for same sex couples? Or, you know, how do you sort of, how do you actually really sort of help move the needle forward in your company um, for LGBTQ uh, employees? So I do think that, you know, people do, I, I think that people do, unfortunately, you know, do some lip service. And then what you hope is, and what I think we should push for. And I think this is part goes back to the point of when you asked about if why, why leaders need to be speaking out on things they may not want to be speaking about. It's because internally their employees are pushing them to do that. Um, and then that's where I think you'll see real change. That's where I think you'll see, you know, different boardrooms, different C-suites. Um, I think you'll see different access to jobs. I think we'll um, get some pay equity um, or closer to pay equity. Um, but that is, that's how is by sort of making sure that we are making sure that it is not just lip service. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, that's, that's a lot of, I, again, I've sort of experienced it as, as a gay American, where I think there are times where you identify that it is lip service and then, you know, find the way to work with them to make it more authentic and more, more actionable and more real. Anthony, can you talk about your own company now? Like how your company got started? What's going, what's your focus on right now? Sure. And what's your what's your big vision for it moving forward? Uh, sure. Uh, so I worked on Secretary Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, and in November when that ended, I started talking to a communication firm in New York City where I was about to sign on and and join them, and was talking to several people who knew me, and they said, "Oh my gosh, that's great." let us know when you land and we'd love to have you run our communications. We'll give you a contract and a very good friend of mine who owns her own business um, <clears throat> set me straight and said, well, how many retainers do you need to start a business? And <laughs> I was like, I don't know, how many do you need? And, you know, I had really, um, this was, I was very lucky in that all of this happened very quickly. You know, this was all happening. You know, the election was the first week of November and this was happening before Thanksgiving. And so, um, a woman called me and said, you know, we've gotten your name. Several people have recommended you. We need a, somebody to run a nationwide bus tour um, on the 
on not repealing the Affordable Care Act and your name keeps coming up. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. We would be very interested in that. You should hire our, you should hire our firm is what I say to her out of the blue. Um, and, and she goes, oh, great, send us your contract. And I said, oh, absolutely. And I hung up and I was like, Google contract. You know, like <laughs> I was, was very like, so, and the Hayes Initiative was born. So um, we are, you know, I'm very happy that I did it. It was a very difficult decision to make because again, I, I really, I hadn't slept in a year and a half and really was not in the mindset of starting a business. And I'm, I'm really grateful to my friend, Emily, who uh, pushed me on that. It was definitely the right move. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're a small firm. There's uh, four four of us plus our graphic design folks, um, and then we sort of expand and contract based on what we need. Um, and so we've been doing quite a bit of expanding, which is which is great. Um, and you know, I'm very proud to say, you know, we we now have a you know a, a small seven figure business, and we are moving ahead and really focusing on continuing to grow. You know, uh, in a in a smart way. Um, you know, I think we were very fortunate in throughout COVID and we certainly had a service that everybody, um, our, our current clients needed and more clients needed. So, um, we were busy, uh, which I, I is such a blessing considering, um, how difficult it was for so many businesses. So Anthony, let's suppose there's a college student out there, you know, they want to break into PR or someone just wants to do PR period. And look for a job. How do they get your attention, or what would you look for in a potential PR person to come onto your firm? Uh, several things. I most of all would want someone who is a hard worker. Um, like I said, I think there are a lot of people out there who are drawn to this profession uh, for the glamour, and I, I get that. I totally respect that, and I think that that is certainly a compelling reason. But I think young people need to understand that it is an enormous amount of work to do this. Um, and so what I look for is somebody who's a hard worker. You know, it means more to me to like when I'm skimming over resumes or looking through stuff for people who can demonstrate like a longevity of showing up even to, you know, like I worked so many jobs. I, you know, my first job was when I was 13 at the bowling alley, um, but I've worked so many jobs throughout my career and <clears throat> any job. Really, if there had been times where I would, any job that was offered, I would work it. Um, and, you know, that ranges from Starbucks to McDonald's to whatever, you know, and I find, I find people who, you know, worked at Starbucks while they went to college, you know, I find that a lot more compelling because that means for four years, <laughs> they showed up on time, <laughs> they did their job. They didn't, you know, they'd never got fired. <laughs> like there's just little things like that, that sort of demonstrate a real sort of work ethic. Um, and I think that that is something that I look for quite a bit. And most of all, I look for, um, you know, I, I myself can always improve on my writing as well, but I always look for people who are strong writers and editors. And I think a lot of times we um, live in a world where um, that is not the most prized thing, but I think work ethic, number one, but it is, People need to understand it is not an easy profession. Anthony, I, I forgot to ask you, you just doing a pre-talk, but we're going to have kind of discount or resources to, to get to the listeners. I'm sorry. Well, you have, I forgot to ask you this during the pre-talk, but we're going to have any kind of gift or discount to give away to the listeners. Oh, I say depending on the scope of work. Sure. It would just depend on what the actual work is, but yeah. Cool. And uh, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Oh, sure. They can uh, find us at hayesinitiative.com. That's Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, uh, initiative.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Anthony J, uh, J-A-Y Hayes. Um, or you can just shoot me an email, anthony at hayesinitiative.com. Hey, Anthony, do you have a favorite social media platform right now? LinkedIn. LinkedIn, okay. I like Twitter as well, um, but I would say those are the two primary. And to our listeners, we have the link to his social media, his gift on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshtlblog.com. And be sure to support our crowdfunding campaign at https slash crowdfunding. Anthony, this was a great talk, but unfortunately, we're coming to the end of it. Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, sure. I think I would just remind everybody that 2021 is going to still be about crisis communication, even with all the vaccines rolling out. Um, so I do think people need to sort of think through that lens as they think about uh, the rest of this year. Uh, and I would say, you know, they should be pulling out their crisis management plan if they haven't already. 
Um, if they don't have one, they should create one. And I think look at what happened in 2020 and what worked well and what didn't and put that into place. And I would strongly recommend that people think about messaging through the lens of being hopeful and forward looking. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. One last thing. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't? No, I, I loved it. It was just a great conversation. Cool. Anthony, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all the great things you're doing. Thank you. And to listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Oh, shit, wrong button.